Good evening, Bahamas. Coming up tonight, trouble at the detention center. We've got the story. As the country slowly reopens, police get ready for a possible uptick in crime. Plus, Arawak key vendors ready to get back to work. Welcome to Our News and thank you for joining us. I'm Kyle Joachim. Top of news tonight, more than half of the detainees at the Carmichael Road Detention Center staged a hunger strike on Tuesday. The matter then escalated into a fight between two detainees. Jared Higgs has more. According to a statement by the Royal Bahamas Defense Force, which has responsibility for security at the detention center, the unrest began at around 8.47 on Tuesday morning. That's when they say 85 Haitian detainees began an active hunger strike and demonstrated belligerent behavior, advocating to be returned to their country. The 67 males and 18 females make up 56% of the facility's occupants. So while migrants are expected to follow the laws of the Bahamas, um, it is not possible for them to get their court date due to COVID-19. But that wasn't the end of the incident, though. The Defense Force says its Marines were able to de-escalate the situation. However, two hours later, a fight between two Haitian nationals broke out. Some detainees reportedly escaped the dorms, destroying several fences and other infrastructure in the process. Order was eventually restored. Darwin Thompson is representative of the UN Migration Agency Bahamas office. He says given the circumstances of the pandemic, keeping migrants detained is unfair. And so it is our belief that detention in this case uh, becomes arbitrary and arbitrary in a case that we, we, we suggest that they should be released. But some are heading to the Bahamas Department of Corrections, according to the Royal Bahamas Defense Force statement. It says it expects several detainees to be charged with destruction of government property. Police Commissioner Paul Rose says he didn't have exact details, but his officers are investigating. Need be, we will take the necessary action, put the people before the court. Some of those migrants have been waiting to go before a judge since February. However, the closure of the courts and even borders has greatly hindered the repatriation process. Thompson pointed to a UN recommendation that called for the suspension of detention orders for new arrivals and undocumented migrants during the pandemic. So that means easing detentions uh, and, and looking at it from a holistic f a family standpoint. PLP Chairman Fred Mitchell acknowledged that the detention center is not equipped for long-term living. He called for the government to get a date from the Haitian government as to when those migrants can be returned home. Usually the Haitian government, in my experience, turns people around quite quickly. So if the reason is that they've been there too long, it probably has to do with the issues in Haiti and their inability to accommodate the request on, on a more uh, speedy basis. Reporting for our news. I'm Jared Higgs. Well, as the country continues to grapple with high unemployment numbers due to the COVID-19 pandemic, Police Commissioner Paul Rowe says the Royal Bahamas Police Force is bracing for heightened criminal activity once the country resumes normal commercial activity. However, the top cop warned the criminal element that police have a strategy in place to deal with it. Jasmine Brown reports. The police chief was candid in his comments as he says he's preparing the force to handle just about everything, including an increase in crime. The reality is... We are putting measures in place to prevent crime. With unemployment pegged between 30 to 40 percent, many have predicted there will be an uptick in crime as people look for ways to keep food on the table. The police commissioner says police are bracing for that possibility. We want the criminal element to know that uh, we are going to be there. I don't expect there, I expect some persons who may, may wish to commit crime and I want to discourage them. That's, that's the best way I could say that because we are going to be there and we'll deal with it. Roll's comments come a day after National Security Minister Marvin Dames told the press outside cabinet that he is confident crime will continue to trend downwards even after some of the strict COVID-19 restrictions are lifted. Dames says he is also confident in the commissioner's plan to address crime. Roll said his policing plan, which is set to be tabled in Parliament later this month, outlines how police intend to deal with the increased risk for criminal activity. But, yeah, we have a, 
a strategy in place. Police statistics for 2019 reveal that overall crime decreased by 7% last year. However, there were increases in the number of murders and armed robberies. Reporting for our news, I'm Jasmine Brown. As the Ministry of Tourism prepares to roll out its first phase of reopening later this month, Deputy Chief Medical Officer Dr. Delon Brennan says they're not too concerned about another surge in COVID-19 cases. Berthony McDermott reports. Health officials are not overly concerned about an increase in COVID-19 cases once borders reopen in July, according to Deputy Chief Medical Officer Dr. Delon Brennan. This despite the fact that major cities in the United States, which makes up some 80% of tourist arrivals to the Bahamas, have seen an increase in COVID-19 cases amid protests. Directly are we concerned specifically about the protests? I think from our side of things, um, we are doing a watchful waiting. Um, the U.S., while Hopkins and other modeling systems um, may predict that there's a possibility that there will be an increased number of cases, um, given that we've not gone through an entire incubation period since the um, protests have started, we would not be able to tell that there was a spike in numbers at this point. So Experts have warned that packed protests could exasperate the pandemic. However, Brennan said health officials have modified their approach to dealing with the virus should cases continue to rise in the Bahamas. So what we are trying to do is modify our approach from, you know, being able to lock it out and assume that, you know, if we just lock down our borders, we'll be able to keep it out of country to one whereby what we're saying is we will be able to monitor and detect quickly. And if we can detect it quickly, then we can control if there are any cases that do pop up in country. On Tuesday, Tourism Minister Dionisio de Aigler announced that the Bahamas will have a phased reopening of its tourism industry starting June 15th. With the phased reopening just days away, Brennan said health officials are comfortable with measures put in place to mitigate the spread of the virus, noting that a robust system is in place. But we also have a system that comes in place that says for every person who comes to the Bahamas, whether they are resident of the Bahamas or a visitor, we will be gathering information as to who would they were in contact with um, during their conveyance, so whether it's by boat or by plane, we'll be able to find out what those details are so that if they were to end up with symptoms that were suggestive, then we have a group of people that we would be able to contact trace. And be Reporting Power News, I'm Bertha New McDermott. Efforts to restore power supply to Abaco and the surrounding Keys continues nine months after Hurricane Dorian battered the island. Bahamas Power and Light announced the re-energization of its systems on Forest Drive in Murphytown. Meanwhile, BPL teams are currently working on Sweetings Village, Treasure Key, Murphytown, Pelican Shores, and Manawar Key. At the end of June, they will work on Murphytown Boulevard, the southern end of Treasure Key, Little Orchid, and Guana Key. To date, power supply has been restored to Central Abaco as well as several areas in North and South Abaco and some of the Keys. Well, this is not the time for the Bahamas government to be silent amid protests across the U.S. That's according to opposition leaders who say changes also need to be made here in the Bahamas. Georgia Bain has more. As racial protests in the United States continue to rage on, the opposition is questioning why the government seems to be so silent on such an important matter. They're calling on the government to let their voices be heard worldwide. We need change in the Bahamas. We need to do the hard work of building a more equal and more just country. How many older Bahamians have no security despite a lifetime of hard work. How many young Bahamians are prevented from reaching their full potential? How can that be right? Amid nationwide protests over the death of George Floyd in the United States, party leader Philip Brave Davis said the opposition stands with peaceful protesters as he insisted that change is also needed here in the Bahamas to bridge the gap between the haves and the have-nots. Former Foreign Affairs Minister and Party Chairman Fred Mitchell also weighed in on the issue, stating that the silence of the Bahamas, which sits on the Human Rights Council, doesn't send the right message to the international community. We are shocked. <laughs> that the Bahamas government, in the midst of this thing which affects Bahamians who live and work and, so, and we are part of the class, uh, the human rights issues, we sit on the Human Rights Council as a, as, as a country, and the Bahamas government is silent, you know, like the cat has got their tongue. And this is the problem we have with them all the time. They have nothing to say on substantive issues, but would rather, would rather engage in nonsense. 
Outside of Cabinet Tuesday, Minister of National Security Marvin Dames said he isn't worried that the racial protests will spill over to the Bahamas. However, social media was a buzz after a young Caucasian Bahamian in Grand Bahama made a social media post containing the N-word. Her brother quickly came to her defense, stating that this is the Bahamas. Since then, the female's fall admission to the College of Charleston in South Carolina has been rescinded and her brother has been fired from his job. Mitchell called on the government to address this matter as their mother is said to have contractual ties with the government. He also called on the government to finally address racist and homophobic comments made by the director of the Water and Sewage Board. Again, the government is silent. The government was silent with Bennett Minnis when he referred to leaders of the country as black monkeys and engaged in a homophobic rant. Reporting for our news, I'm Georgie O'Bain. Churches are preparing to once again welcome congregants through their doors on Sunday. After a two-month hiatus, worship services are resuming with some big changes. With more on this, here's Jillian Gray. And sanitizing stations, masks, temperature guns, and seating assignments will now be the new norm for most congregants as they'll meet a new set of procedures when they go to their place of worship this coming Sunday. And the resumption of worship is something that we certainly have been looking forward to, and I think a lot of people are very, very happy with that. Of course, we have to bear in mind that there's some very, very definite conditions under which we have to operate because we are still well within a global pandemic. My preference, of course, is in-person worship. No air conditioning, greeting after service, or sharing of hymnals will be permitted in Catholic churches. Archbishop Patrick Pinder said services will be on a first-come, first-served basis, which may force some parishes to add a second or third service to accommodate people. At St. Andrew's Presbyterian Kirk, a sign posted near the door outlines the new procedures for worship. Pastor Bryn McPhail said they've spoken with with their at-risk congregants and encourage them to remain at home. While they will have less than 50% of their congregation present, MacPhail said he's just happy that worship can now resume. Instead of 250 people, I'm expecting 40 or 50, and those 40 or 50 people will be masked, and so the singing's gonna take a bit of a hit, and so I'm not looking forward to that. We're, we're not yet going to celebrate communion. Meanwhile, Living Waters Kingdom Ministry chairs have been spaced out and the entire sanctuary sanitized. Marketing manager Raynell Wells said they are excited to welcome their congregants and have taken precautions to ensure everyone remains safe. It's so funny because our older congregants, they're excited. <laughs> they're more excited than our younger congregants. Um, and those are the ones who are at risk. But um, we had a lot of mixed um, reviews on whether they want to come back, but they're ready to be here, but they just want to make sure that it's safe. An instructional video was posted on Living Waters Facebook page to inform congregants of the new procedures. After nearly 10 weeks closed and with dozens of changes, all church leaders agree that service on Sunday will look and sound different. The very nature of worship um, has to do with the way we gather. It has to do with, with the way we, we come together um, uh, in, in a very, very personal way. So the, the idea of social distancing and so on is not really natural to what we do. It's important. It's necessary at this time. Reporting for our news, I'm Jillian Gray. All right, thanks, Jillian. Still to come, Bahamas Development Bank investing in small chicken farmers. Plus, an Iraqi vendor prepares for his, his restaurant's eventual reopening. Stay tuned. The Bahamas Development Bank confirmed a public-private partnership with a group of cons agriculture consultants for a community poultry project. Jared Higgs tells us the investment is meant to be a hand up to small chicken farmers. It's a $1.6 million equity investment that is meant to be a kickstart for small farmers. PDB is acting primarily as a catalyst along with 
um, technical specialists. So they bring technical expertise. So essentially, it is really a public-private partnership with the technical experts uh, bringing in their, their value to the project. Commercial banks avoid agricultural loans. The Bahamas Development Bank says it recognizes the need to give farmers a chance. The BDB initiative involves the establishment of a central poultry unit. The CPU will purchase and resell bulk feed, day-old chicks and equipment, cutting input costs significantly for farmers who are currently paying $4 for a single broiler chick in some instances. We believe this is critical as some of the challenges facing the poultry industry, notwithstanding policy decisions in terms of tariffs, etc., but also in terms of costs, particularly around food, for, for, for the chicks, etc. One of the agriculture consultants on the project is Zakita Bethel. She says besides a lack of funding, many farmers lack access to knowledge. She says that's where her team will step in. We are building in technical support. Most producers, if you ask them, if you, pr you choose one and or choose 20 and ask them, besides capital, what is one of the challenges that you see that could take your operation from one, one level to another? And it's that constant support. Next Monday, the consultants will meet with interested farmers via Zoom. In the same week, they expect to start accepting applications. The Development Bank's unit head for strategic development, Sumaya Cargill, says the plan is to expand. With respect to our growth plan, although the pilot project or the first phase is going to be our new providence, we envision that we will rapidly be able to scale our support system to the family islands. That's a very important point for BDB because we believe that family island farmers should play a role in feeding their local communities. Reporting for Our News, I'm Jared Hughes. Well, an Arawaki restaurant owner says while he is prepared for the eventual reopening of the tourist area, he's still concerned about the phased reopening of the country's economy and the threat of COVID-19. We had memorabilia shirts all over the place, only two is left. Most of the hats that people have signed and stuff like that, they're all gone. Most of the priceless memorabilia that hung along the roof and walls of Gone Fishing at Araki are all gone now. Owner Hamish Moxie said despite securing his place as much as he can when he was forced to close in March, the item somehow picked up legs and left. His restaurant, comprised of mostly wooden material, now sits with furniture covered by tarp and plastic as he awaits to wipe the dust off and reopen. Before I even seen it or heard it or anywhere, people were calling me like, man, it's almost time, you know, they're getting ready to open y'all back up. Everybody's excited, you know, so we thank God. I love the fact that we're open now and, and we can separate you know, good space and people be comfortable and nobody have to be up on each other. Last week, Prime Minister Dr. Hubert Minister said government was still reviewing dates for when Arawaki establishments would be allowed to reopen, adding government was still looking at the challenges some of those restaurants would face in a closed environment. But Moxie says that's not a problem for his business, as the beach serves as his backdrop and there's nothing but open air. We're going to be moving tables and separating tables and we're going to put two actually on the beach, one at each end and we're going to separate them so at least we can seat 30 people comfortably uh, with plenty of social distancing and so forth like that. We're going to have to, for the time being, we use glass and so forth, and, but we're going to stick with um, uh, sanitary stuff. Moxie says his staff will be required to wear face masks and hand sanitizing stations will be placed throughout the restaurant. As he's been forced to close for the past three months, Moxie, like most of the vendors along the Araki Strip, felt it in his pockets. 27 return guests in the first week that had to cancel. Um, that comes here every year, that comes direct to go on fishing and spend a day or two while they're here. Wow. And then we had a lot of cruise ship passengers. We were pretty solidly booked until around, I would say, mid-July. Arawaki has been a popular tourist attraction for years, offering visitors a variety of traditional Bahamian meals. However, due to COVID-19, the Strip has become a ghost town with hardly a soul in sight. But as the country slowly reopens with tourism to begin its phase reopening June 15th, Moxie says he's eager, but still cautious. And we had to go back to the health and well-being of each and every person, the clients and the staff. And then everybody got to go home to their family. I'm very concerned about my family and the health of them, and I don't want to take anything home to them. Still to come, police officers hand out dozens of care packages. Stay tuned.
You're watching Our News. Welcome back. The Royal Bahamas Police Force gave out dozens of care packages to people and nonprofits today. Leading a delegation of high ranking police officers was Commissioner of Police Paul Roll. What we have done was we have asked each of the divisional commanders to identify uh, at least 20 uh, persons within their community that might be in need because we want to help. The officers made more than a dozen stops that included the Quaco Street and Wolf Road police stations where care packages were handed out to thankful residents. On behalf of the community of Wolf Road, we would like to extend our greatest, deepest appreciation for this. Roll and his team also donated food items to Great Commission Ministries. Bishop Walter Hantel says the donation will help to feed the needy. This will go a long way in helping us to feed our clients, to feed the homeless, the street people all over this nation. Great Commission has been around now for 33 years, feeding the poor, feeding the hungry, sheltering the homeless. Still to come, a student athlete ready to make waves in a water polo. Stay tuned. Finally tonight, news, water polo opening doors for another Bahamian student-athlete. Marcellus Hall reports. Well, a couple of weeks ago, we told you about one of our student-athletes who had an opportunity to get an, a scholarship to Wagner University, a Division I school for water polo. Turns out he's not the only one from the Bahamas national team program. Yet another young man on his way to college as well. Here's his story. Also joining the growing list of youngsters headed to college to play water polo is Alex Turnquest. He'll be headed to Connecticut. He says he's surprised at how much he was able to accomplish through the sport. When I first joined water polo, it was around six years ago, so I had no idea that I could end up over here. I wasn't even thinking about that. So it's kind of surprising that we could take it all this way. TurnQuest saying water polo has opened numerous doors to see the world. We've gone like a lot of places over the Caribbean, over the world. So that's been really fun and interesting. Like you don't expect it whenever you come to like this pool and practice that you could end up like in different countries playing with people you may never meet otherwise. Meanwhile, his coach, Coach Borbley, says, you know what? Hard work pays off. In fact, he says this is really what they had hoped for all along. All that work, all that relationship, all that networking, all that traveling, what we did to expose these, uh, these players to a higher level of water polo is now paying off. But in my mind, I, was, I always wanted to have exceptional water polo, and I always wanted to establish a so-called Bahamian or Caribbean water polo. So when this guy shows up, and the next generation next year shows up at colleges, they already know, ah, these guys from that Bahamian school, they in. So more Bahamians getting opportunities to continue their education through sports. Meanwhile, so much more to come. I'm Marcellus Hall for our news.
Thank you for joining us for our news tonight. On behalf of the entire team, I'm Kyle Joaquin. Remember, you can catch our news on the go with the Replica Play app. Have a good Wednesday evening, Bahamas.